Hello, dear brothers and sisters. Pastor Bird here, still hunkering down in the inimitable bird's nest. I am excited uh, that we can continue our study in the canons of Dort. So let's have a, a word of prayer and then we'll get cracking. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much again that we can study this historical document that that millions of Christians have looked to as a summary of the truth of, of your salvation. And, and we pray, O oh God, that it would be instructive to us and help us to, to come and to understand your purposes more clearly and to be more amazed at your grace. So work and teach and, and bless us in this way, we ask through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, I wonder how many of you know this hymn. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Now, I have to admit, for some sentimental reasons, I kind of like that hymn. Some of you hear that, and you're probably thinking, No way, Pastor Bird, tell me it ain't so. I mean, you're teaching us the canons of Dort for crying out loud. Surely you must prefer, tis not that I did choose thee, for Lord, that could not be. This heart would still refuse thee, hadst thou not chosen me. Well, truth be told, I do prefer that hymn, but I don't find the first song all that objectionable, or at least not primarily so because of the phrase, I have decided to follow Jesus. And I know that phrase can be anathema for a lot of Calvinists. But there's another hymn that might help us understand this a little better. And you'll recognize this one too. I sought the Lord, and afterward I knew he moved my soul to seek him, seeking me. Now, this little stroll down Hymnody Lane has a purpose. There are some, under the mistaken rubric of Calvinism, who'll say, we don't make a decision for God. We don't choose God. We don't seek God. And certainly, we can agree with that, mostly, in so much as we're talking about a person who hasn't been born again. The person who is dead in their trespasses and sins cannot decide, cannot choose, cannot see God. But when the Holy Spirit regenerates us, that's exactly what we do. He graciously, sovereignly, and efficaciously, efficaciously changes our will, softens our hearts, and then we do exactly that. We decide because of the decision of His will in eternity past. We choose because he chose us before the foundation of the world, and we seek him because he first came to seek and save the lost. We have and exercise faith because God has given it to us as a free gift. And one of the reasons we need to keep this in mind is there, there is a distorted view of of Calvinism, sometimes referred to as hyper-Calvinism, that collapses the whole doctrine of salvation into the doctrine of election. They so emphasize God's sovereignty that they make faith or, or the act of believing such a foregone conclusion that it almost becomes a peripheral issue. They're so focused on God's sovereignty, they leave virtually zero room for human responsibility. And what they end up doing with the doctrine of uh, assurance is turn it into this sort of deep internal feeling that you're elect. And you might imagine this, this means for evangelism or any kind of impassioned plea for unbelievers to repent and turn to Christ by faith. It, it's just left in the dust. On the other hand, you need to know from the Arminian perspective, any form of Calvinism is hyper-Calvinism. And they so emphasize uh, 
the freedom of man's will and human responsibility that God's sovereignty gets left in the dust. And honestly, that's what you and I are most likely to encounter, although there are hyper-Calvinists in our community. In terms of the Arminians, you often hear phrases like this, God will not force himself upon anyone. Or the Holy Spirit's a gentleman, and he'll not enter your hearts unless you ask him. Again, God's sovereignty is left in the dust. It's interesting that both of those errors follow the same path. The hyper-Calvinist takes the doctrine of God's sovereignty to what they believe is its logical end. The Arminian takes the doctrine of human responsibility to what they believe is its logical end. Now, I'm all for using logic when you're formulating doctrine, but logic is an important tool, not a goal. The goal is God's glory, and the best way to pursue that chief end is to let God's word establish ends and goals and boundaries. That's one of the reasons the canons of Dort are so helpful. They do just that. So Article 6 begins by grounding salvation in God's sovereign decision or, or God's eternal Decree, And here's how the article begins. The fact that some receive from God the gift of faith within time and that others do not stems from his eternal decision. And then the beginning of Article 7 helps us understand what election is. Election or choosing is God's unchangeable purpose by which he did the following. Before the foundation of the world, by sheer grace, According to the free good pleasure of his will, he chose in Christ to salvation a definite number of particular people out of the entire human race, which had fallen by its own fault from its original innocence into sin and ruin. A great deal of the consternation that people have against Calvinism is right here, that salvation stems from his sovereign, eternal decision. And, and we need to recognize that, that, that this mindset is a special affront to our culture, the one in which we live. I mean, we are democratic through and through, and choosing is what people think makes their life have meaning. To make a choice means I'm free, I'm my own person, I've got liberty. If you want to uh, sort of validate that claim, think of how pro-abortion groups have framed their arguments for years. It's not, we're for ab abortion. No, no, we're pro-choice. And anything that impinges on my choice is bad. It would be a mistake to think that mindset, that worldview, doesn't impact the church. But what does that kind of thinking exalt? ultimately the one choosing. It has to. This is why the language of the canons is so helpful and biblical when it speaks of the sheer grace of God. And then further on in Article 7, when it explains, God did all this in order to demonstrate his mercy to the praise of the riches of his glorious grace. You see, this is where the rubber meets the road. Those who think all people have the ability to choose and that their salvation is grounded in their decision can't get around the fact that they're looking for something good in man. If we follow scripture and understand that the ultimate choosing is God's, then salvation is grounded in something that's good and gracious in him. You see, if you start with man's choice, then you end up necessitating man helping God in salvation. Even if that help is nothing more than exercising our will to believe. And what that means, dear ones, is that God doesn't have a choice. God cannot choose to rescue any particular people. We've taken God's right to decide 
away, and then you're left with a creator who can't save, but but it's only in heaven responding to fallen creatures. You see, there's so many problems with that. First off, it robs God of the glory and pleasure of being the one who saves. And second, it's impossible for the unregenerate or unbelieving person to make that decision in his own. That there's none who seeks after God. Romans 3, 11, all people are born dead in trespasses and sin. Ephesians 2, 1, the God of this world, the devil, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Now, this is going to be another area that we'll explore more thoroughly when we get to the third and fourth head of doctrines in the canons. But the Bible's clear because of our fallen condition. We can't first seek God. We can't first see God and respond. We can't first believe in our own strength till he does something sovereignly and powerfully from heaven, namely cause us to be born again. The canons tell us that God does do that. Again, out of sheer grace, he does that. Follow along in Article 6. In accordance with the decision, he graciously softens the hearts, however hard, of his chosen ones and inclines them to believe. And then in Article 7, it was God who decided to give the chosen ones to Christ to be saved and to call and draw them effectively into Christ's fellowship through his word and spirit. In other words, he decided to grant them true faith in Christ, to justify them, to sanctify them, and finally, after powerfully preserving them in the fellowship of his Son, to glorify them. I have to say I love that language from Article 6. He graciously softens the hearts, however hard, of his chosen ones and inclines them to believe. Dear ones, if God didn't do this, there'd be no Christianity. There'd be no people of God. We would simply be lost today, tomorrow, and eternally. You see, this is what fallen man deserves. This is what he's got coming. This would be giving man his due. If God was fair, heaven would be empty apart from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If God left man to his own ability to decide, hell would be full of every human being who ever lived. The fact is, everyone who is saved is the object of God's sheer, lavish grace, because none of us deserves his kindness, irrespective of our background. We're all equally lost in sin. Article 7 tells us those chosen were neither better nor more deserving than others, but lay with them in the common misery. He did this in Christ, whom he also appointed from eternity to be the mediator the head of all those chosen, and the foundation of their salvation. There's a lot here. And Article 7, you should know, is really sort of a summary, a bit of an introduction to the rest of, of the canons. But let's make sure we've got these basics in our mind about biblical salvation. Biblical salvation stems from a decision from God, and it's marvelously gracious, not partly gracious, not mostly of grace, but all of grace, and it had to be that way, because those who come to salvation were one bit more righteous than anyone else. We shared in the common misery and bondage of sin. One of the ways we can check our hearts on this, as to whether we really understand this well or not, is whether it humbles us or not. Because that's what sovereign grace does. It humbles the sinner before a God who's infinitely merciful and altogether of grace. And let me say this, because this is sometimes an objection hurled at Calvinists. 
this doesn't mean that election is arbitrary. And that's what people do sometimes wrongly assert that Calvinists believe. But that's not it at all. It's not at all arbitrary. People are chosen according to the free good pleasure of God's will. The fact that we don't know the secret purposes of God doesn't mean those purposes are arbitrary. It just serves to remind us that we are not God. Biblical salvation is unchangeable. That is, if God chose you, he wouldn't, and we can even say he couldn't, unchoose you. Interestingly, interestingly and providentially, part of my morning devotions today was Isaiah 14, 24. The Lord of hosts has sworn, as I have planned, so shall it be. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. When, when God makes a plan, no human being, no power on earth can overrule it. And God's eternal plan must stand. His eternal decision is either certain, fixed, and unchangeable, or he's not the God of Scripture. So biblical salvation is unchangeable. And then biblical salvation is in Christ. This was the plan of the Godhead before the world existed to save a people in Christ. The, the canons here point us to Ephesians 1 and to Romans 8, but I want us to take a brief look at John 17 as we begin to wrap up. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I turn there with me to John 17. This, of course, is our Lord Jesus' high priestly prayer offered just hours before he would go to the cross. And he's speaking tenderly, longingly to his Father as though his saving work is already done. So, so glance there, if you would, at John 17. I'm going to read verses 4 and 5. And then I'm going to skip down a few verses. Verses 4 and 5. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And skip down to verse 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom you've given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you've given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. And what I want you to see is Jesus is grounding his saving work in an agreement that he had with the Father before the foundation of the world. And that includes the particular people the Father gave to the Son. Now, this is sometimes referred to as covenant of redemption, a covenant that was joyfully uh, agreed upon within the Godhead, which we'll refer to later in the study. But this redemptive plan, the plan of the Godhead to save a particular people, was conceived within the mind of the Godhead in eternity past. And all those who would receive the blessings of this plan, namely salvation, were the ones given to Christ before we were born, before we did anything good or bad. This is actually what the Apostle Paul describes as being in Christ, as being chosen in the beloved. Well, in the next lesson, we'll start getting into the real nitty-gritty, sort of peeling back the layers of Calvin's onion or tulip, as the case may be. But since I began with uh, hymns, I'm going to close with a couple stanzas from our beloved Isaac Watts. Why was I made to hear thy voice and enter while there's room when thousands make a wretched choice and rather starve than come? T'was the same love that spread the feast that sweetly forced us in else we had still refused to taste and perished in our sin. If it weren't for God's grace, we would still refuse to taste and see that the Lord is good.
The doctrine of election is a wonderful biblical teaching that glorifies God and tells us how he saves sinners. And it leaves us with nothing but praise upon our lips and the empty hands of faith hanging on to the cross of Christ. May the Lord be with you all. Amen.